Chapter 26, Fluid Balance. In this chapter, we're going to learn how the lungs and the kidneys work together to regulate the pH of the body. If pH drops too low, that's going to cause acidosis. We need to understand why that's such a big deal and why it's more common than alkalosis. We can also discuss alkaline diets and ionized water. Advertisements for these things often involve pictures like we see here to the right, which is absolutely stupid. The person here on the left is not sick, they're dead. And the person on the right, not healthy, they're dead. This little bracket here shows the very narrow range in which the body's pH must be kept. And lucky for us, our lungs and kidneys do an excellent job of that. We don't need to worry about what we eat. In fact, what we eat isn't going to alkalize or acidify the body at all. It might acidify the urine, sure, but that's about it. And lastly, the big homework question for this chapter are going to be ABG tests. So you need to be able to do these. We'll start by discussing potassium regulation and then talk about regulating the body's pH. To do so, we'll need to cover some basics about acid-base balance, talk about different types of acids, and how these different types of acids could be excreted from the body. Let's start with bodily fluids. As I drink a bunch of water, it gets absorbed into my bloodstream, at which point I call it blood plasma. Some of that liquid leaks out and surrounds my cells, and I would call that extracellular fluid, and some of that water enters my cells to become part of my cytoplasm or intracellular fluid. Let's move on to potassium regulation. We learned in the previous chapter that aldosterone can promote the reabsorption of sodium from my filtrate back into the bloodstream in the distal convoluted tubule. And it did so by activating the sodium potassium pump. Therefore, as I reabsorb more sodium, I lose more potassium. Now, as I taught it to you in the previous chapter, reabsorbing sodium was going to cause water to follow, raising blood pressure. Unfortunately, that was a bit of an oversimplification. That is what should happen, but aldosterone has very little effect on overall blood pressure. It can, however, affect sodium and potassium levels in our bloodstream significantly. Maintaining proper levels of potassium in the extracellular fluid is absolutely necessary for the function of cells that fire action potentials, like neurons and muscles. To fire an action potential, sodium had to rush into the cell, but then potassium had to rush back out. If you had too much potassium outside, you would block the ability of potassium to rush out. If you didn't have enough potassium outside of the cell, then the sodium potassium pump wouldn't work. You couldn't set up the sodium gradient in the first place. Therefore, altered levels of potassium can affect neuronal and muscular function, leading to both overexcitability and underexcitability, depending on the exact cell type. What we need to know is that it just messes with the functions of these cells. Therefore, the potassium levels in my plasma must be kept within a very narrow window. It can't be too high or it can't be too low. Because the potassium in my plasma is going to be roughly the same as the potassium in my extracellular fluid surrounding my muscles and neuronal cells. After a meal, my potassium levels in the plasma may spike, especially if it's a salty meal. To compensate for this, the kidneys can excrete excessive potassium, and whatever they can't handle, the liver can sequester or hold on to. This maintains my potassium levels in the blood. Then between meals, if my potassium levels drop, my liver can release some of the potassium that it's sequestered. And these two mechanisms should keep my blood potassium levels fairly constant throughout the day, no matter what my environmental factors are. 
The kidneys excrete potassium based on a circadian rhythm. This means they're assuming that you are getting most of your potassium during the day while you're eating meals. And at night, they need to switch to conserve potassium levels. Too much potassium in the bloodstream, or hyperkalemia, can be caused by renal failure. If the kidneys cannot excrete excessive amounts of potassium, it may remain in the bloodstream. Conversely, hypokalemia, or low blood potassium, can be caused by excessive electrolyte loss due to sweating, vomiting, or diarrhea. There can be some other conditions that would lead to hypokalemia, but those are the three most common. We are not going to cover the signs and symptoms of hypokalemia and hyperkalemia. But if you go on to nursing school, you will have to memorize these things. And in that case, you should learn to love this type of information here called an infographic. It tries to help you to learn a bunch of boring facts by giving you a funny picture that's easier to remember that can assist you in the same way that a mnemonic assisted you in learning the 12 cranial nerves. I don't remember all of the signs of hypokalemia, but I do remember a sick Walt. I've had a number of former anatomy students get into nursing school and then ask me, hey, professor, I just learned that we are supposed to use insulin as a treatment for hyperkalemia. What gives? I thought insulin regulated glucose levels in the blood, not potassium. And that's more or less true. But the way that we regulate blood glucose levels is to pump glucose out of the blood using a glucose sodium symport protein the same type of protein that we found in the nephrons of the kidney. We didn't pump glucose using ATP, but with a sodium gradient. So when cells want to pump more glucose out of the blood, they increase their sodium gradient by turning on the sodium potassium pump. So the mechanism of insulin action isn't to directly activate glucose pumps, but to activate the sodium potassium pump. And then as these cells pump out more sodium, that sodium wants to enter the cell even more and will drive the import of glucose through that glucose sodium symport protein. We can take advantage of this by giving insulin to patients who are suffering from hyperkalemia. When we give these patients insulin, the body responds by saying, oh my gosh, we've got a glucose problem. We need to fix this quickly. This is the fastest way to also solve a potassium problem. Insulin turns on the sodium potassium pump, which pumps sodium out and does some stuff with glucose, fine, whatever. But it's also pota pumping potassium in the opposite direction, out of the blood into the cells. And that fixes the hyperkalemia. So this is why you would be giving insulin to a patient suffering from hyperkalemia even a patient who does not suffer from diabetes. The body simply responds to this hormone very quickly by activating the sodium potassium pump in cells throughout the body. So that wraps up potassium regulation. Next, we're going to cover regulation of the body's pH. Up in the upper left-hand corner is an image that I frequently see. I live here in Oregon and, well, everybody's susceptible to really stupid ideas. Here in Oregon, a lot of people are very interested in organic foods and all natural diets and avoiding synthetic chemicals and pesticides. And along the way, they get bombarded with this idea that all sickness is caused by acidity and health represents alkalinity. That's just dumb. The body's pH needs to be kept within 7.35 to 7.45. Anything lower or higher than that is going to lead to sickness or death. So we need to learn that, hey, to the left of 7.35 could be sickness and death. To the right of 7.45, sickness and death. And in fact, our body's pH needs to be kept in between those two. Now, even that's a bit of an oversimplification. That's going to be the average pH, or the pH of most of our fluids, 
like plasma and extracellular fluid. There are some places in the human body that are going to be acidic, especially the stomach is very acidic, and the bladder is going to contain some fairly acidic urine most of the time. And a few places are alkaline, especially the intestines and uh, the pancreas would be fairly alkaline. But everything else needs to be kept within a fairly narrow window right around here. Dropping lower than 7.35 is going to be called acidosis and quickly leads to death. Anything above 7.45 is called alkalosis and also quickly leads to death. I like this little infographic here. If you don't remember which is an acid and which is a base, alkalosis leads to kicking up the pH, whereas acidosis, you're sliding down the pH scale. We need to cover a little bit of chemistry of acids and bases. Nothing terribly in depth, but we can describe acids and bases as either being weak or strong. For instance, here, I've got hydrochloric acid, which is a strong acid. If you dumped hydrochloric acid into water, all of the H's would leave the CL's. I'd have complete dissociation between hydrogen ions and chloride ions. That's a strong acid. This ammonia that I've drawn down below is a weak base. If I have a bunch of extra H pluses, some of those ammonia molecules would accept the H+, plus, becoming an ammonium ion, but not all of them. So weak acids and bases do not completely ionize in solution, whereas strong ones do. We need to keep the pH of the body within a very narrow window because our enzymes begin to denature when the pH changes in either direction. For instance, we talked about hemoglobin and how if hemoglobin was in a condition of acidity, it would tend to release oxygen. So if your lungs are acidic, it's not going to be picking up any oxygen and it's going to be useless. Conversely, if hemoglobin was in an alkaline environment, it was going to hold on to oxygen. So if that hemoglobin is traveling around your muscles and they're in an alkaline environment, it's not going to release oxygen to your muscles also completely useless. So we need to keep that active site there in the hemoglobin in a fairly narrow window so that it can both grab onto oxygen and release oxygen. Ooh, I drew that backwards, sorry. Release oxygen and grab oxygen depending on the environment that it's in. And hemoglobin is only one enzyme that is affected by pH. All enzymes are going to be affected by pH, including the sodium potassium pump found in the kidneys and in our neurons and in our muscles, actin and myosin, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, you name it, any of those enzymes are going to be messed up if our pH changes. That's why both acidosis and alkalosis can be very deadly very quickly. Technically speaking, acidosis is a state of the pH of our bodily fluids dropping below 7.35. If I'm only talking about the blood, we should be calling it acidemia below 7.35. But generally speaking, if your blood plasma is at pH 7.35, so is your extracellular fluid and your cytoplasm. So I'm just going to be saying acidosis from here on out, even if what you really test in the clinic is for acidemia. Similarly, alkalosis is the pH above 7.45. If you wanted to be specific about the alkalinity of strictly blood plasma, you would say alkalemia rather than alkalosis. But these two things happen at the same time. So once again, I'm just going to be saying alkalosis from here on out. Both of these conditions are devastating to every organ in the human body. So we need to keep our pH within just a very narrow window here. If we drop too low, we're going to enter into acidosis and our body will not be functioning properly. Drop below pH seven and you're probably dead.
Conversely, going above 7.45 causes us to go into alkalosis. And once again, we're going to be sick. And going above 8, well, that's into the death range there. So that's a very tight window. Our lungs and kidneys have to be very accurate in their measurements and have to respond very quickly to any changes to prevent sickness and death. Next up on our tour of chemistry, there are going to be a few different types of acids that we need to worry about. Fixed acids are those that do not leave solution. That means they stay liquid, and liquids have to be eliminated by the kidneys. Two examples of fixed acids that the kidneys might have to excrete are sulfuric acid and phosphoric acid. Next are organic acids. These are ones that have carbon atoms, and not just any old carbon atom, but ones that could still be used for energy. Two prime examples are citric acid and lactic acid. Citric acid is made by aerobic respiration, whereas lactic acid is made by anaerobic respiration. And I don't want to excrete these things, even though they're acidic, because they still contain energy that I could use to generate ATP. So we're going to metabolize those further, probably in the liver or maybe some other tissues. You may not think of it, but lactic acid, hey, that's pretty yummy. We still want to eat that stuff. The third type of acid are the volatile acids. Volatile means that these acids can evaporate, leaving the liquid and becoming a gas. And our one volatile acid is carbonic acid. This can be excreted at the lungs. We can make carbonic acid every time we make carbon dioxide. CO2 will react with a water molecule to form this thing here. H2CO3, which is carbonic acid. And being an acid, it can donate a proton. So it can dissociate into an HCO3 minus and an H plus. That's what makes carbonic acid an acid. When it dissociates, we call this molecule here bicarb, and then we have an H plus. Ask your chemistry teacher why this is called bicarbonate. It doesn't really make sense to be called bicarb when it's only got one carbon atom. That'll drive your chemistry teacher a little bit nuts, probably, because it's an annoying story. What we need to worry about is that carbon dioxide, as it's produced in the body, will react with water to form this acid here. And I have an enzyme that can speed up this reaction. But this reaction happens on its own. Carbon dioxide plus water leads to carbonic acid. That's, uh, as a tangent, that's one reason why we worry about elevated carbon dioxide levels in our atmosphere. Elevated carbon dioxide levels reacts with water in the ocean, increasing levels of carbonic acid in the ocean, leading to acidification of the ocean. But that's really a topic for another class. What we worry about is that also happens in the human body. And in fact, it happens a lot more quickly in the human body than it would in the ocean, because we have an enzyme that speeds up this chemical reaction. Therefore, as the body produces carbon dioxide, which it does any time it undergoes aerobic respiration to produce ATP, which is pretty much all the time, it's going to be generating some carbonic acid, which would lead to acidification of the human body and acidosis, which, if we didn't have lungs or kidneys, would lead to death. As a tangent, there are medications that can inhibit this enzyme and block the formation of carbonic acid. These are used in the treatment of hypertension and in the treatment of alkalosis. Because of this chemical reaction, I like to tell students to think of carbon dioxide as an acid. Now that would make any chemistry teacher cringe, but in the human body, as carbon dioxide levels increase, it can always react with water to produce carbonic acid. 
this will increase the levels of H plus within the solution of our bodily fluids. Hence, it's okay to think of carbon dioxide as an acid. As CO2 levels go up, the pH of the body goes down. Conversely, if I exhale carbon dioxide, removing it from the body, that will also remove H pluses from the body, raising our pH. So as I exhale more, I'm going to raise the pH of my body tissues. To summarize, there are three basic types of acids. Fixed acids are ones that remain in liquid form and must be removed by the kidneys. Organic acids are ones that are still useful to the human body and therefore will be metabolized by other cells like the liver. We're mostly going to ignore the organic acids, but we'll also focus on the volatile acids. These are ones that leave liquid form and become gases and therefore can be excreted by the lungs. And the only volatile acid we're going to worry about is carbonic acid. There's a problem, however. My tissues are producing these acids, which must be removed by the lungs or the kidneys. So these acids are going to wind up in a vein. To get to the lungs or to the kidneys, all of these acids have to travel to the heart first. Then they could be pumped to the lungs. And for the fixed acids, they'd have to be pumped back to the heart before being pumped to the kidneys. These acids could be doing damage anywhere along the way, but I especially worry about my heart. It has to get every single acid that the body produces before it could be excreted. To solve that problem, I've got a buffering system. I can temporarily neutralize acids or bases thanks to buffers. Buffers are chemicals that can either donate or accept a proton to keep the pH of a solution within a narrow window. So buffers can help neutralize these acids until my lungs or my kidneys can excrete them. In your chemistry class, you may use molecules that act as buffers. A single chemical can either donate or accept a proton. But in the human body, we typically rely on buffering systems. That means a weak acid plus its conjugate weak base. Ugh, what does that mean? Well, let's take a look here. I've got two carbonic acids. In the human body, both of these wouldn't be in their acid form. Probably one of them would donate its proton and the other wouldn't. So I've got one carbonic acid still in the weak acid form, but the other one has switched over to its conjugate weak base. I've got a bicarb here and an H+. These two molecules can act as a buffering system. If the pH were to go too high, this guy could still release an H+. If the pH were to drop too low, this guy could accept an H+. And in reality, it's not two molecules of carbonic acid that would be a buffering system, but gajillions a much larger number than any biologist likes to think about. Our three major buffering systems are a protein buffering system, the carbonic acid bicarb buffering system, and a phosphate buffering system. I'm going to talk about these in a little bit more detail, but before I do, I just want to ask you, do you think the body has proteins, carbon dioxide, and phosphate simply to buffer acids and bases? And the answer is no, all of these things have other jobs or other reasons for existing in the human body. Proteins, of course, do all sorts of stuff. They are enzymes like the sodium potassium pump. They are structural proteins like collagen and keratin. Carbon dioxide is produced as a byproduct of respiration. And phosphate is, of course, a component of ATP as well as part of the backbone of RNA and DNA. Different amino acids can act differently because their R groups vary. But every amino acid has a carboxylic acid group, 
which at pH 7.35 has probably donated its proton already, and an amino group, which at this pH has probably accepted an extra proton. Therefore, if the pH drops, and we've got extra H pluses floating around, this carboxylic acid here could accept an H plus to become COOH once again. Whereas if the pH goes too high, then this amino group here, this ammonium, could donate its H plus to become NH2 once again. Hence, these amino acids in a solution act as buffers. They can either accept or donate protons if the pH goes out of our normal range. Phosphate can do the same thing. We've got phosphates every time ATP is used to produce ADP. This is the other thing that flies off of that. This is very important in maintaining the pH of intracellular fluid or in the cytoplasm where all of our ATP is located. When we learned about the hamburger shift, we learned that the bloodstream is very capable of converting carbon dioxide into carbonic acid, which when it donates a proton becomes bicarb. And then if we need to move that in or out of a red blood cell, we had to trade it for a chloride. The mixture of carbonic acids and bicarbs acts as a buffer. The bicarbs can accept an H plus if the pH were to drop too low. The carbonic acids could donate an H plus if the pH were to raise too high. The problem with buffering systems is that I only have so many of these molecules at any given place in time which means I can only donate or accept so many H pluses before I run out of my buffer. It's therefore very important that I have organs that can excrete excess levels of acids and bases. These buffers simply make sure that my acids and bases don't do any damage as they are traveling to the lungs and kidneys for excretion. The lungs are going to be capable of excreting the volatile acid carbonic acid as it's broken down into CO2 and H2O. Other acids that can't leave solution must be removed by the kidneys. So the We next need to put all of this information together. The lungs can help regulate the pH of the body by regulating carbon dioxide levels. If the pH of the body drops, meaning I have too many free protons floating around, like we see here, I can simply excrete CO2. That leaves behind an OH-, which will very quickly react with those H pluses to form water. This removes H plus from our bodily fluids, which reduces the acidity or makes the body more alkaline, raising the pH. Conversely, if CO2 levels in the body rise, it'll react with water molecules to form carbonic acid, and many of these acids will donate their protons to our bodily fluids, making the body more acidic. So if we need to acidify our blood, we simply breathe more slowly. The kidneys, on the other hand, could remove liquids. When the body produces carbon dioxide, to prevent it from forming bubbles in our bloodstream, we quickly converted it into this liquid here, carbonic acid. And when this carbonic acid reaches the kidneys, the kidneys can do one of two things with it. They could excrete it in its acid form, or they could excrete it in its base form. So in this picture here, I've shown that we're saving the base. We're holding on to bicarb while excreting the H+. If I'm getting rid of H pluses, I'm removing acids from the body, making the body more alkaline. This is frequently what the kidneys are doing, but they could just as easily switch roles and hold on to the H plus and excrete the bicarb. H plus or free protons can be removed 
in a number of different locations. I have sodium proton antiporters located in the proximal and distal convoluted tubules and the collecting duct. When we learned about the kidneys, we mainly focused on the reabsorption of sodium half of what these proteins are doing. But the other half is equally important. This gets rid of acidification within our body if I'm excreting H plus to the lumen of the nephron. So what would happen if I ate a bunch of acidic foods? Like if I drank a bunch of cranberry juice, which is really pretty acidic. Well, as those acids got absorbed into my bloodstream, they would be buffered by my carbonic acid bicarb system until they reached the kidneys. And it's here that I would reabsorb sodium and pump hydrogen ions in the opposite direction. I would also reabsorb this bicarb as well. Therefore, when I eat something that's really acidic, that's not going to make my body more acidic because I've got buffering systems. What will happen is all of those extra H pluses that I just ate will ultimately wind up in the lumen of nephrons to become urine. I'll be making the inside of my bladder more acidic and nothing more. Conversely, what if I ate a bunch of alkaline foods? Because, hey, I hear that's really healthy for me. Well, the exact opposite's going to happen. I'm going to reabsorb hydrogen ions and instead excrete bicarb. I'll be making my urine more alkaline, not my body. So those were some of the basics of acidosis and alkalosis. And I primarily focused on acids because generally the body needs to be removing acids because it makes a lot of them, including carbonic acid, which is a volatile acid that the lungs can remove, which is generated every time we produce carbon dioxide. We talked about organic acids like lactic acid and even some fixed acids that the kidneys must remove. Along the way, these acids must be buffered until they reach the organs that can remove them. So we talked about some buffering systems, but next up, we're going to be focusing more heavily on acid-base balance. So that's the chemistry that we need to understand in order to move on to the physiology. So next we're talking about acid-base balance. Acidosis is when the body produces too many acids. Too many free protons means the pH has dropped too low and alkalosis is the opposite. I don't have enough free protons floating around and my pH is too high. What you don't know is that my cat is currently bopping me in the face trying to get a second breakfast. But let's see if I can get through this nonetheless. Our lungs and our kidneys are going to be regulating carbon dioxide and bicarb levels respectively. And if they can't do this, it could lead to one of four conditions respiratory acidosis or metabolic acidosis or respiratory alkalosis or metabolic alkalosis. What's more is that whichever organ is failing, the other one can try and compensate for that failure. So when the body goes into either acidosis or alkalosis, that means there's been a failure in the circulating buffers in our kidneys or in our lungs. It could also be caused by a cardiovascular condition or damage to the brain that the lungs and kidneys can't compensate for. Acidosis and alkalosis will have an acute phase. You are either too acidic or you are too alkaline, and it's as simple as that. But then later is a compensatory phase where one of the other organs tries to compensate for the one that is failing. And that'll make things for you a little bit more difficult to interpret. For starters, whether we're in acidosis or alkalosis is going to be caused by a defect in the lungs or a defect in the kidneys. We're just not going to cover those other weird ones. So a respiratory disorder is going to lead to a change in carbon dioxide levels, whereas metabolic disorders meaning a problem of the kidneys, will lead to changes in the liquid bicarbonate. 
Therefore, we can measure CO2 and bicarb levels to try and get an idea of how the lungs and the kidneys are functioning. For instance, elevated carbon dioxide could lead to acidosis, or a drop in pH. The primary cause of this is hypoventilation. If you hold your breath and stop breathing, your body is going to keep generating carbon dioxide, but it's not going to leave. This will lead to more carbonic acid being produced and an acidification of your body. Conversely, alkalosis can be caused by a drop in carbon dioxide. Hyperventilation is dangerous because it can lead to an elevated pH. When somebody's hyperventilating, they are exhaling abnormally large amounts of carbon dioxide. This gets rid of too many acids from the body, leaving behind the bases, causing alkalosis. And this is why hyperventilation is dangerous. So what's an easy treatment for somebody who's hyperventilating? Well, get them to breathe into a paper bag. That way, every time they exhale, they're going to be inhaling elevated levels of CO2, which should compensate for their CO2 loss due to hyperventilation. Have you seen this movie? If not, you should go watch it. It's a fun movie in the way that movies from the 60s were slow and fun. But spoiler alert, these four scientists here almost die from some sort of space virus, but they learn that the space virus can't survive in alkaline conditions. So to cure themselves of this space virus, called the Andromeda strain, they simply hyperventilate. And now I've ruined the entire movie for you. When the kidneys malfunction, this can lead to metabolic acidosis or metabolic alkalosis. Metabolic acidosis is frequently caused when the body produces too many acids, ones that cannot leave the bloodstream. Those are the fixed and organic acids, like lactic acid. The kidneys can remove some fixed acids, but if we're producing too many, we might overwhelm the kidneys, leading to metabolic acidosis. Conversely, severe bicarb loss could also lead to metabolic acidosis if the kidneys are excreting too much bicarb. Metabolic alkalosis is caused by retaining too much of that bicarb or losing too many acids, such as with vomiting. The stomach is full of hydrochloric acid, and when we vomit, we lose that acid, leaving behind bases, which could lead to metabolic alkalosis. One of the tricky things about the ABG tests, which I promise we're about to tackle, is that acidosis can be caused by both too many acids or too few bases. Metabolic acidosis, therefore, is caused by too many liquid acids or too few liquid bases. Two common acids in liquid form are lactic acid and keto acids, whereas bicarb is our liquid base. Conversely, metabolic alkalosis is caused by too many liquid bases or too few liquid acids. For instance, if the kidneys can't excrete bicarb, it could be building up in the bloodstream, making it more alkaline. Or we could be losing liquid acids, like losing too much hydrochloric acid due to vomiting. To further complicate matters, if one organ is failing, the other one is going to be able to compensate. For instance, let's go through ketoacidosis. If I'm producing too many keto acids because I don't have enough glucose to use for energy and I'm instead burning fat, those keto acids are going to be traveling through the bloodstream to get to my muscle tissue to be used. And if I have too many of these keto acids that they begin to overwhelm the buffers, what might happen? Well, if I'm getting too acidic, the kidneys could always excrete some of the free H pluses and hold on to more bicarb. Therefore, with too many keto acids in the blood, we would expect bicarb levels 
to go up. Conversely, the lungs could also excrete more carbon dioxide. Hence, I would be lowering my CO2 levels. To do that, I would have to breathe faster. And is that something I'm going to be doing if I'm exercising and burning a lot of fat? Well, yeah, that's exactly what's going to happen. If you're exercising so hard that your blood glucose isn't enough and you have to start burning fatty acids, converting those into keto acids, dumping them into the bloodstream for your muscles, why, yes, you're going to have to breathe faster to make sure that as your muscles get those keto acids, that you're not causing the body to become too acidic. So that's another reason why we breathe faster when we exercise. Not just to bring more oxygen to our muscles, but to get rid of more carbon dioxide to compensate for the acids that we're producing during exercise. Okay, got that? Let's move on to another example. What about poor ventilation? This could also lead to acidosis. And poor ventilation means I can't breathe very well. Let's say one of my lungs has collapsed. And if I can't exhale enough carbon dioxide, too much carbonic acid is going to be building up in my body, which will lead to acidification of my blood. What are going to be my compensatory mechanisms? Well, the kidneys can do the exact same thing. They excrete free protons and reabsorb bicarb. So if I had a punctured lung, I might expect my bicarb levels in the bloodstream to go up. It's not that my lungs regulate bicarb. My lungs regulate CO2. But if my lungs aren't regulating CO2 properly, my kidneys might start altering my bicarb levels. What would the lungs do? Well, they would try to breathe faster, but of course the lungs have suffered trauma. So they're not going to be able to do that in this case. All right, next. All right, so that brings us to the ABG questions. You can either follow the flow chart shown to the right, or you can ask these three questions on the left. We must first ask whether the patient is in acidosis or in alkalosis. That should be easy. If their pH is below 7.35, they are in acidosis. If it's above 7.45, they are in alkalosis. If it's neither of these two, then we're probably not worried very much. The next question is what's causing the problem? If our patient is in acidosis, that could be either caused by too much acid or too little base. Conversely, if our patient is in alkalosis, that could be caused by too much base or too little acid. So we need to do a little bit of matching here. Look at both the CO2 and bicarb levels and see which one would be causing our problem. And then look at the other one. That's going to be our third question. If one organ is failing and causing a problem, is the other organ trying to compensate? For instance, high levels of CO2 could be causing acidosis. We would call that respiratory acidosis. But if we also see high levels of bicarb, too much base is trying to compensate for the acidosis. So that's our third question. If both CO2 and bicarb levels are off, one of them must be causing the problem. The other one must be trying to compensate for the problem. Let me go through an example. You're often in these sort of case studies going to be given a whole bunch of information. But really, these are the three numbers here that we need. So our first question, is our patient in acidosis or alkalosis? I will give you this chart here on the right. You must be able to use it. These are not numbers that we memorize. But 7.46 is too high. Now, it's slightly too high, but we don't really care about slight or not. This is above the normal range. So our patient is in alkalosis. You'll probably see worse, but this is still not considered healthy. So our next question, what's causing the problem? 
Well, let's look at CO2 levels. It's 48 millimeters of mercury, and 48 is higher than this normal range here. So we've got too much carbon dioxide. All right, I'm going to stop there for a moment. We're going to move on to bicarb really quickly. At 35, let's take a look here. 35 is also too high. So both of these values are too high. So our second question is, which one is causing the problem? Would too much carbon dioxide cause alkalosis? No. We think of carbon dioxide as an acid, not as a base. So too much of an acid would not cause alkalosis. So it's not this one. So hopefully it's the next one. Would too much bicarb cause alkalosis? And yes, indeed, too much bicarb would cause alkalosis. So who regulates bicarb levels? Well, that's the kidneys. Therefore, this is metabolic alkalosis. And because carbon dioxide levels are also off, it's compensating. And we can even double check. Would too much carbon dioxide compensate for too much base? Elevated CO2 levels should be making things more acidic. And our problem was alkalosis. So our compensatory mechanism is trying to fix things by lowering the pH. If the lungs weren't compensating, we'd probably expect this pH here to be even higher than it was. But thanks to the lungs, our problem with the kidneys isn't quite as severe as it could be. Let's do another one. pH of 7.15, CO2 of 68, and bicarb of 22. And this time, we're going to do it in a multiple choice format. So a pH of 7.15 is definitely below our normal range. So we are in acidosis. So I can immediately get rid of option C because we know it's not alkalosis. So our next question, what about CO2? That's 68. That's definitely higher than it should be. And let's just go look at our next one, bicarb of 22. That's on the border, but that is considered within our normal range. So this question should be easier. I really only have one possible candidate, and that's CO2. Let's just double check. Would too much carbon dioxide cause acidosis? Why, yes, it would. Too much of an acid causes acidosis. And who regulates CO2 levels? That's the respiratory system. So I can immediately cross out the metabolic option. And that just leaves us with these two. I just have to decide whether this is compensated or not. And because bicarb levels are not altered, this is uncompensated. So altogether, we would say uncompensated respiratory acidosis. As a side note, that's the easiest way to say it. I hear some other textbooks say respiratory acidosis with a compensated metabolic alkalosis. And that's not only overly wordy, but it's also incorrect. This patient is not in alkalosis. The kidneys, if they were compensating, would be trying to make things more alkaline, but they have not succeeded. So just call it compensated or uncompensated. Don't tell me which direction we're compensating. I already know it's in the opposite direction of whatever the problem is. And to try and tell me it's a compensatory acidosis or a compensatory alkalosis is not only redundant, it's technically incorrect. The only thing that is acidosis is when your patient is below 7.35. And the only thing that is alkalosis is when your patient is above 7.45. So do yourself and me a favor and be brief. To summarize, either the lungs or the kidneys could fail, leading to acidosis or alkalosis. If the lungs are failing, that's going to change carbon dioxide levels. If CO2 levels go too high, we would call that respiratory acidosis. If CO2 levels dropped too low, for instance, we were hyperventilating, that could cause respiratory alkalosis. 
Similarly, kidney failure could alter levels of bicarb. If my kidneys were not excreting bicarb very well, that would lead to metabolic alkalosis. On the other hand, if my kidneys were filtering out way too much bicarb, that could lead to metabolic alkalosis. And every time we get one of these, the other organ can try to compensate. Lower levels of bicarb could be compensated for by lower levels of carbon dioxide. And elevated levels of bicarb could be compensated for by elevated levels of carbon dioxide, or vice versa for either one of these. To summarize, your lungs and your kidneys should be working to keep your body's pH between 7.35 and 7.45, no matter what, whether you're exercising, eating acidic foods, eating alkaline foods, I don't care. As long as you're not getting sick and dying, your pH is remaining constant. Nevertheless, there's this myth out there that you can alter your body's pH by eating certain types of foods. And this is based off of a little bit of science that is completely misunderstood. So the little bit of science is, is that cancers are frequently found in an acidic environment. And that's because when cancer cells grow, they grow really fast, outpacing their oxygen supply. And then they switch to anaerobic respiration, which generates lactic acid. And so tumors are frequently acidic. Now, most tumors can't generate enough ATP anaerobically. And so most tumors are benign. You and I are probably going to get 10 cancers in our life, and yet probably not going to die from any of them. And that's because the tumors can't keep growing indefinitely, and our immune system will probably wipe them out eventually. Tumors do not prefer this environment. It stops their growth. In fact, the only tumors that we really worry about are the ones that fix the problem by turning on angiogenic signals and giving themselves more oxygen which switches them from an acidic environment back to a pH of between 7.35 and 7.45. Nevertheless, this little factoid here that many tumors are acidic has led to the idea that if you just made your body more alkaline, you could cure cancer. For instance, this infographic here on the right shows that these alkaline foods are supposedly really good for our health. And I'm not going to argue that fruits and vegetables are good for your health, but it's not because they're alkaline, especially not lemons. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Citric acid is not a base. It's an acid. So lemons are not going to make your body more alkaline. But the morons over at Natural News thinks that it's one of the most alkalizing agents out there. And if you're stupid enough to believe that acids will make your body alkaline, then you really don't understand basic chemistry or physiology. Nevertheless, the fact that many tumors are acidic is just a correlation. Acidity doesn't cause cancer. It's the opposite. Cancer causes acidity. Still, there's a very important concept in science, and that concept is the difference between correlation and causation. Just because we see two things happening at the same time doesn't necessarily mean that one of them caused the other. This is tricky because two things happen at the same time a lot. Name two things, there's probably some place where they're happening at the same time. So just for fun, I have some graphs here of two things happening at the same time. And there's a very tight correlation between these two things but hopefully you should not be concluding that one of them caused the other. For instance, the divorce rate in Maine is very similar to the per capita consumption of margarine in the United States. These two things might be tightly correlated, but that's just due to chance. Neither one of these things is causing the other. I can't be sure. Maybe if we all ate more margarine, we would be causing more divorces in Maine, but uh, I'm guessing that's not the case. Similarly, we probably shouldn't ban Nicolas Cage movies simply to reduce the number of drownings in swimming pools. 
There are plenty of other good reasons to ban Nicolas Cage movies, but not because we think he might be causing folks to die in swimming pool-related drownings. And let's see here. People dying by getting tangled in their bedsheets is tightly correlated to the revenue generated by U.S. skiing facilities. But nobody would believe that skiing facilities cause folks to be tangled in their bedsheets and die. Unless there's some sort of sinister plot that they don't want you to know about. <laughs> no, just kidding. This is a case of correlation. And here's one of my favorites. The rise in autism is tightly correlated to the rise in organic food sales. Do we think that organic food causes autism? No more than we think that vaccines cause autism. Correlations can be negative as well. For instance, cancer rates in the United States have been going down, which is something that uh, a lot of folks don't want you to know about or believe. They would like you to be scared. But in reality, we're getting better at preventing and curing cancer. On the other hand, the use of GMOs is going up. Do we think that GMO food usage is leading to the decrease in cancer rates? No, absolutely not, even though there's a very tight negative correlation between these two. So that was just for fun, the difference between correlation and causation. But that should wrap us up for this chapter. Make sure you can do those ABG questions. I've given you a number of them on the homework. If that's not enough, you won't be the first anatomy students to struggle with this. Just do a quick Google search for ABG quiz and you'll find a whole bunch more. But that's going to wrap up my job of lecturing to you today.